Hey everybody, Doc T here again. Um, got my other coffee mug, this one's blue. And I am my horse's advocate. And any of you who happen to be on, well, you, if you're just listening to this, you couldn't see my coffee cup. This says, I am my horse's advocate. But um, this is some swag that you can get on the website uh, under, what's the menu item? I think the menu item is resources. And then you go down to the bottom and says swag and you get in the swag and there's t-shirts and sweatshirts and all sorts of things, which will help support um, what's going on. Phone covers, caps, totes, uh, different colors, different things. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, a shameless plug for the Horses Advocate website. Um, all the swag helps promote uh, the idea, the idea of helping horses thrive in the human world. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say this. Thank you for being here. Just you listening and possibly telling other people is the best support that you can give the horse uh, for learning a little bit more about the horse, telling other people about this podcast. And if you wouldn't mind, if you get a chance, uh, just if you're listening on Apple iTunes, uh, I think it's Apple Podcasts now, um, go in there and write a review. I would love that. Um, I don't think anybody's written a review or if they have, I've missed it. I haven't checked uh, and I will check. In fact, as soon as I'm done with this podcast, I'm going to go in and, and check and see who's written some um, reviews. And maybe in the future, some podcasters actually read some of these reviews um, I don't think I'm going to do that. I just am so grateful that if you reach out and just say yes, because Apple actually looks at this. I'm sure all the other uh, Spotify or um, the Google Play, I'm sure they also read the reviews and the reviews are important for rankings. And uh, I don't think there's too many people out there actually doing any podcasts on horse health. There are a few. I found them. I've listened to them. Uh, some of them are agenda-based like... Uh, uh, Platinum Performance has some really good podcasts, well produced, uh, with really great guests uh, that I tend to tear apart. <laughs> and I should have a couple of podcasts just on some of their podcasts uh, because they're so um, siloed, they're so um, invested in their agenda that they can't uh, get out and look at other things. Uh, on a, on occasion, they will, but um, not. Usually here, I don't have an agenda other than to horse, help horses thrive in the human world uh, to fill in the blanks of the missing horse owner's manual. So um, our children and their children can look back and say, okay, this is how horses are really cared for. This is what works. This is what doesn't work. And this is why we're doing it this way and get them back more to the uh, genetically, traditionally tried and true way of keeping a horse healthy and happy. So um, we have the Horses Advocate uh, group, which is a private group on Facebook. And I made it private to um, prevent uh, spammers and anybody else from getting in. <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's worked to a good degree, but we still get some people in there that don't take the time to read or to understand. Um, they don't dig at all. They just want to be spoon fed. And you guys here on the Horses Advocate um, who are members don't want to be spoon fed. This is a, a resource for you to dig in and look for and then ask for some help to uh, clarify through me and other people are here. And, and that's great. Um, but a lot of people just like to be spoon fed. All right. I'm going to I'll read this one. Uh, this is, came in June. It says, I've had Henry since May 13th. <clears throat> And so this is approximately 30 days later that she's writing this. He was being fed this regimen. Uh, he has multiple medical issues, including right rear stifle injury with floating bone chip, recurrent bilateral uveitis, that's inflammation of the uvea, which is part of the eye, uh, and about 25% total vision left, and anhydrosis. Anhydrosis is the fancy name for non-sweating. So she got this horse and it was being fed one half scoop safe choice twice a day. That's a brand of uh, grain. One half cup alfalfa pellets twice a day. Just half a cup. Oh, well. One half cup aloe vera juice twice a day. 
Now, just a side note, aloe vera is amazing. If you ever get burned, like you step on a hot coal, like I did when I was a child, my mom reached over for the aloe vera plant and I had to sit an hour from where I got burned to the time I got home with this huge charred blister on the bottom of my foot that was, I'd gone beyond my crying days. I was just so painful. I just, it was horrible. And as soon as she got home, she grabbed the aloe vera plant, which is a cactus. She broke off one of the aloe vera uh, stems and squeezed the gel inside onto my foot. And instantly the pain went away, the blister got reduced. And other than the repair process that occurred several days after that, it totally resolved the burn. So I'm a big believer in aloe vera, squirted from the plant onto burn, no doubt about it. But for some reason it's become popular to add to horse feed. So it goes down into the horse's gut where they say it will cool and calm all inflammation in the gut. And I'm sitting here saying, will it get past the acid bath of the stomach? But I always ask that question and nobody gives me any answers. Anyway, let me continue. It was getting one scoop, one AC twice a day. One AC is a product made by some people out in Arizona who, I think it's Arizona. I may be wrong. Uh, who have concocted this uh, medicine that it's, uh, it's uh, not an FDA approved medicine that has helped a lot of horses overcome non-sweating. And a lot of horses are very grateful for 1AC. And I've got a lot of horses who have been put on 1AC. But again, like most medicines, they don't get down to what's the reason behind it. And I don't think anybody still has gotten the reason for non-sweating. Um, my friend um, who is behind the Equi Winter Patch uh, believes it's an electrolyte imbalance that, that's caused by something. And she restores the electrolyte imbalance between the cells and allows the horse to start sweating again. And that's great. Um, but anyway, in this case, 1AC is being given. Then there's, and the list goes on, uh, 10 grams of MSM once a day. MSM is methyl sulfonyl methane. And what's really interesting is methyl sulfonyl methane is, the, is a, a compound that has sulfur in it. And sulfur is so critical for so many um, uh, processes that occurs in the body. Uh, three of the amino acids that we have have sulfur in them. And sulfur is so, so important in so many things that we do. It also stinks when you burn the horse's hoof or you burn your hair, it smells. That's the sulfur being released. But a lot of people believe that MSM orally will actually add sulfur, which is important for polyglycosamine, uh, sulfonated polyglycosamine glycans, or what we call PGAG, P-GAG, polysulfonated glycosamine glycans. And that's a sugar molecule that has the sulfur attached that helps lubricate the joints and, and helps uh, reduce uh, joint inflammation. One scoop simplify once a day. I, I apologize. I don't know what Simplify is. Uh, I guess everyone else does. Um, I don't know if it's a electrolyte, vitamin, mineral balancer thing. I'm not sure. Uh, one scoop electrolytes. Now, you know that electrolytes are basically minerals with either an added or subtracted uh, electron. So instead of being sodium, it's sodium plus. Instead of being chlorine, chloride, it's chloride, chlorine minus. And NaCl, Na plus and Cl minus come together because one has an excess electrical charge. So they bind together in NaCl, which is your basic table salt. So uh, electrolytes are basically salts that have been, um, oh, I forgot the exact terminology, chemical terms, but they've lost again electron and they become electrolytes. One teaspoon aspirin, and aspirin is really interesting because aspirin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or what they call it NSAID. And this NSAID is, works on the uh, prostaglandin pain pathway. And just like all the other uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories from Butte to Prevacox to um, Banamine, uh, these are trade names of course, um, but that's what everybody knows them as. Um, but what's interesting is when I went to pharmacology class it, at vet school, Cornell, um, they basically said, the dissociation constant for aspirin, which is PK value, uh, was, uh, was pH dependent. 
And because a horse has such a different pH, aspirin is basically not beneficial to horses. And this is why you don't see a lot of people feeding aspirin to horses. Uh, it works on dogs. It works on humans, of course. It works on cattle. We had huge boluses of aspirin we'd give to cattle. That would work. But we were taught at Cornell that aspirin doesn't work on horses. That said, aspirin has become popular here and there to be given to horses. So here is one teaspoon aspirin. So I guess that is a powder that she has bought, that the previous owner had bought, um, that has so many milligrams of aspirin. I don't even know what it has, baby aspirin uh, or full-blown aspirin. Uh, but we don't know how many grams of active ingredients are in there. But this horse is getting aspirin because I guess it had this floating bone chip, it's stifle injury and it was painful. And aspirin is dirt cheap. Plus he was getting free choice coastal hay. Uh, he had not completely shed his winter coat when I got him in mid-May in Texas. So here's a horse that's not shedding his hair coat, which is an indication of a pituitary that is um, sending out work orders that prevents the horse from shedding his hair coat because the hypothalamus is saying, hey, we've got increasing daylight, but the message from the hypothalamus that the pituitary isn't working, so the pituitary keeps cranking out, hey, it's winter, keep your hair coat. Uh, if you don't understand what I just said, um, I have loads of podcasts or webinars or discussions on what Cushing's disease is and lack of losing a hair coat in the spring is a failure to recognize that we have increasing daylight and uh, people call that Cushing's disease, which it isn't. Uh, it goes more toward the root of the underlying problem. <clears throat> okay, so that's what this horse is being fed, all these things, which is crazy. I switched them over to grain-free when I got them. Soybean meal, alfalfa Timothy pellets, a flake of alfalfa or coastal hay every now and then, just because. I love that, just because. <laughs> Free choice salt, which is the best, and fresh water, which I assume comes from the ground or someplace. Um, and he is on 10 acres of pasture with two other geldings. That's perfect. I mean, that means he's got three acres, 3.3 acres, uh, to himself that it can share with the others or they all get together and bite the same area of grass, but they still have 10 acres to move around. So I think that's really good. Uh, so that's just perfect. As of yesterday, he is sweating, seems to have better movement, actually trotted in the pasture. The uveitis is under control for a minute. <laughs> she, I love her. I love her um, Let's not celebrate yet. <laughs> that type of attitude is good. Um, and he looks beautiful. I see the difference, but I may be seeing what I want to see. I know the angles of the photos aren't the same, but what do you think? She puts two pictures up of the same horse. And um, I think the horse looks better, but of course, I'm going to be preju prejudiced too. Anyway, what was interesting was there's a couple of things in here I want to go over. And this stems from another question that I got from somebody else who said, what are the best oils to give a horse? And I want to go back to this person's horse, Henry, uh, and discuss what oils are. Uh, oils are fats. Oils are basically liquid fat at room temperature. And that's important to understand because fats, you have to understand that there's there's three elements that make up fat, all fats. They are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, CHO, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, some of you listeners might say, aren't those the same elements that make up sugar? You're absolutely right, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They make up both sugar and fat. This is why when you eat a Snickers bar, it turns into body fat, duh, right? I mean, it just, that's how it happens. Because Snickers bars are mostly all sugar or any candy bar and you'll gain body fat because of that. Okay, so I have plenty of podcasts on that or information on the website, thehorseadvocate.com forward slash membership, hint, hint, uh, that will discuss um, where that comes from. And it's even on the free side, under the topics, under blogs and nutrition. I think I have a blog titled uh, The High Fat Diet, which is how the horse gets its fat in the wild. That's free, you can read that under the blogs and nutrition. But um, let's take a look at it. If you think of the carbons 
arranged in a circle. I call it a ring. When carbons are in a ring with the hydrogens and oxygens kind of going off of that, maybe a carbon going off of that, those are sugars. But when the ring is split open and becomes a string or a line of carbons in a row, that's a fat. So it's just that simple. So if you have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a ring structure, it's a sugar. And when it's in a string, it's a fat. And your body has the ability to break these things back and convert them. This is why insulin bringing uh, glucose to the liver uh, can turn that glucose into fat. It breaks the chain and spreads it out. It becomes a free fatty acid. And those free fatty acids or FFAs, uh, what you and I would call fat, are free to move around. They're not bound to anything and they flow through the fat cell. But that was a whole Zoom webinar. If you're not a member, you should go find out about the ins and outs of fats and you'll understand all of that. But let's keep talking about this horse and the improvements that the horse saw and what oils are that the other person asked about, what is an oil? So the number of carbons will determine whether we call it a short chain, a medium chain, a long chain or a very long chain fatty acid. Fatty acid, I'm going to say fatty acid, you can say fat. It's interchangeable. So the short chain fatty acids are about six carbons or four carbons long. And the, and the short chain fatty acids are butyrate, acetate, and pyruvate. What's interesting about those three is pyruvate can be taken to liver and converted into uh, glucose. That's pretty interesting. So they can take this short chain fatty acid pyruvate and convert it into uh, glucose. And the drug metformin prevents that from happening. And so it preserves the fat, it decreases the amount of sugar flowing in the blood, which helps uh, diabetics. So that's why metformin is used. Uh, acetate and pyruvate can be used, converted into sugar and used as fuel uh, within the cell. It's a more complex problem, but they do that. Then you have butyrate and butyrate is butter. <laughs> and everyone wonders why I put butter in my coffee. The reason I put butter in my coffee and blend it with a blender. And I'll give, give a shout out to Dave Asprey who founded Bulletproof Diet, Bulletproof Coffee, the whole Bulletproof Empire is his based on his experience of drinking uh, tea with yak butter, butter made from yaks uh, in South China, I think. Uh, or Tibet, um, which is in China. Uh, as he was uh, finding out more about his life, he discovered adding this uh, butter to the tea uh, was not only delicious, but actually improved his uh, brain acuity. And he's big on uh, trying to change his body dynamics based on experimentation. And uh, I followed a lot of things that he's talked about. And he's really done a lot of research on the mitochondria in the cell and the use of uh, butyrate and butter. So it's one of the reasons why I, I have butter with my coffee every morning. Um, again, drinking it out of my, um, there it is, the horse's advocate uh, coffee mug, which you can get under swag, another shameless plug. Uh, every, every bit helps, uh, keeps um, this program going. Um, but anyway, um, butyrate is important. And I found it fascinating that there is a company out there, feed company, and I can't remember which it is. I think it's Triumph. I'm pretty sure it's Triumph Feed. Um, but they were starting to advertise a food that had a beauty pearl. And beauty pearl was their proprietary name. Now, beauty isn't B-E-A-U-T-Y, but B-U-T-Y. And what they're doing is they're adding butyric acid, which is short chain fatty acid to the food in an effort to uh, calm what they call leaky gut syndrome in the horse. And I thought that was fascinating because leaky gut syndrome isn't caused by or prevented by or healed by uh, butyric acid. Uh, it is caused by uh, uh, gut uh, dysbiosis, meaning the, the gut microbes are not uh, right. They're being fed the wrong food, such as sugar on a constant basis. Uh, the horse is stressed. There's all sorts of reasons to create leaky gut, including the lectins from the, uh, the plant proteins that are in the hulls of the grains. Uh, they all breaking down the zolulin, um, uh, the, the tight junctions. And um, 
leaky gut has a whole bunch of things. But what's interesting is the gut microbiome in the colon loves to eat cellulose. Cellulose is the structural carbohydrate. And cellulose, uh, when broken down, is broken down into short-chain fatty acids, including butyrate, pyruvate, and acetate. And these three um, short-chain fatty acids uh, are immediately put into the blood. They don't need a carrier, uh, an escort, if you will, like insulin. They can just get in there. And some of them can go directly to uh, the muscle cells. Some can go directly to the brain uh, and fuel that. That's why I drink it. And some can go to um, the liver where they're added upon. Now, this next bit of information, I'm not sure if anybody's actually figured this out. Uh, they might have in humans um, having trouble finding the information. Uh, I haven't seen it in horses, but I believe that horses can add carbons to the four to six carbon length chains, the short chain fatty acids, to make them eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22 carbon lengths long. And they always, always go in pairs. There's no odd numbers in this. It's always even. That's why I gave you the even numbers. So the short chain fatty acids become medium chain uh, um, fatty acids. The medium chain uh, fatty acids are attached to the glycerol molecule and you take three of these medium chain uh, free fatty acids and tie them into the glycerol and you get triglycerides and the medium chain triglycerides are what make the MCT medium chain triglycerides MCT medium chain triglycerides that are in that are popular in humans in their coffees uh, pardon me in their coconut oil <laughs> there I go with the coffee again so the coconut oils uh, are medium chain triglycerides and they're 8, 10, 12 carbons long. Um, I personally uh, drink purified eight carbon long uh, medium chain triglycerides and I add that to my coffee as well. So I have the short chain, the medium chain triglycerides all going in, giving me instant energy. They're not being converted into sugar. Uh, they can actually be converted into ketones, which is a type of fat uh, that can power the brain uh, and do a lot better than just pure glucose. Um, so I try to make an effort of going back and forth between ketones and sugar, pulsing it every day or, you know, every week I pulse, and I'll have a little bit of a sugar meal. I had blueberries last night. Uh, blueberries are, have a lot of beneficial things, but they have glucose in it. And it was nice to have that little bit of sugar and that sugar will help balance out. So my mitochondria can have both sugar and fat and become flexible. And flexibility is so important to uh, keep the proper function of all the mitochondria in all of our cells, including the brain. So I like to go back and forth and it really keeps me sharp. Um, Hint, hint, everybody, <laughs> start drinking bulletproof coffee and have some blueberries every once in a while. There you go. Um, now, uh, bulletproof.com. Yes, Dave, I endorse you. Thank you for all that you've done for me. I know you'll never hear this podcast, uh, but uh, you've reached and touched a lot of people, and now you're touching a whole horse community. You and other podcasters who are really trying to get out there and help people understand metabolism with a cutting edge technology that we've learned and understanding of how things go. I'm also going to give a shout out to Peter Tia MD. His podcasts are amazing. Um, Gary Tobbs, um, who wrote Good Calories, Bad Calories, as well as many other. And he talks about pathological science. And I find that fascinating. I talked about the parachute study in an earlier podcast, which is basically pathological science. And I'm probably going to do another podcast soon uh, about an interview I had. Uh, I heard of of uh, Gary Tobbs and, and his whole take on this pathological science, uh, which doesn't mean that scientists are bad guys. They're just humans and humans um, don't always think clearly <laughs> and have agendas. I have no agenda here. I just want to help your horse thrive in a human world. But let's get back to Henry for a second and, and the fat that he's eating. So when he was eating Safe Choice and he was having some alfalfa pellets and he's having a uh, coastal hay and let's see, electrolytes, uh, MSM, 1AC, aloe vera juice, things like that and simplify. Um, he was getting a lot of inflammatory ingredients in there. 
But one thing that wasn't mentioned in there were the ingredients of Safe Choice and the ingredients to simplify. And what's really fascinating is a lot of these pelleted foods, these commercial foods that are made for your horse, have to go through a mixing machine. There's this huge machine that is constantly moving and mixes all the ingredients and then forces it through a pelleting machine or some sort of extruder to make whatever is in the bag that you get. And there's a lot of friction in this movement and to uh, augment or to lubricate these uh, feeds to get through the machine so it doesn't bind up and grind to a halt, they have to add an oil, just like any machine has grease. Like I still have a, a, a squeak in this chair. <laughs> it's been in the past couple of podcasts. So I, I brought in a lubricant to help stop that. I haven't found the squeak yet, but the lubricant will prevent these machines from binding up and stopping. And so it has to be a food grade lubricant. You can't just throw in some motor oil, you know, or some WD-40 because you don't want to ingest that. You have to ingest an oil that's a biological oil. So we have tons of these biological oils that are made from vegetables and seeds, such as corn oil, uh, vegetable oil, soybean oil. Every time you have soybean meal, the oil has been removed. You have safflowers, uh, canola, and all these other seeds that have been ground into whatever and the oil extracted. And that oil is being added back into the food. And they are so inflammatory. And I'll tell you why they're inflammatory. Or at least I'll try to. I don't know if everybody knows why these things are inflammatory. But all these oils that come from seeds are what we affectionately know as PUFAs. P-U-F-A apostrophe S, PUFAs. And PUFAs stand for polyunsaturated fatty acid, P-U-F-A, polyunsaturated fatty acid. So let's go back to our string of carbons with hydrogen, hydrogen and oxygen attached. Now, in this string of carbons that could be 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 carbons long, they will add hydrogens to the top and bottom of this string of carbons. And it will be completely saturated with hydrogens. And when you have a, a fat that's completely saturated, it's called a saturated fat. It means hydrogens are on every possible part of the carbons that can accept them. Now, I'm not trying to turn you into organic chemists. God only knows most of us run from organic chemistry, but we are organic beings and we run on organic chemistry. And to understand this, we just have to have a little bit of knowledge, not to be dangerous, but to understand the principles. And all saturated fats are solid at room temperature. That's the way you find them. So when you have a chunk of beef, steak, whatever, or chicken, and you see that body fat, those are pure saturated fats. Now, what's really interesting about saturated fats in humans is they are very good. They are non-inflammatory. They do not cause heart disease. They do not cause atherosclerosis or plaques in your heart. This is so important to understand. We are so brainwashed by media, by advertising, and by our governments to drive in the fact that if you eat a diet high in fat, you're going to get atherosclerosis and have a heart attack. And yet the low fat diet craze has been around for decades and yet heart attacks are increasing. Atherosclerosis is increasing. All these cardiovascular diseases that we're having are increasing and all cardiovascular diseases lay on a platform called metabolic syndrome. Humans, human metabolic syndrome. It's identical to equine metabolic syndrome, except the result, we don't see cardiovascular disease in horses. And I'm gonna tell you why, um, but we see it all over in humans. And this is because we've been driven to believe that a low fat diet is healthy. And there couldn't be anything further from the truth. There are books written about this. Gary Taub's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, goes into it in infinite detail, like 26 hours worth. It's an amazing book. You should all read it. And that'll help you understand that it's the hormone insulin that's causing atherosclerosis, secondary to it's doing its job. But um, I digress. We're talking about horses here. 
So horses don't eat solid fat. They, they're just not meat eaters. They, they just don't get it, all right? They only eat vegetables, meaning forage. So let's look at what a saturated and unsaturated fat is. In the unsaturated category, you have two subdivisions. One are the PUFAs, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, where there's two or more carbons that don't have hydrogens attached. So if you can imagine a string of carbons, you know, let's say 18, 20, 22 carbons long, and two or more of those are missing a hydrogen, they've been moved and gone to a different place on the fat. That is a polyunsaturated fatty acid, a PUFA. And those tend to go more toward the arachidonic side of the fatty chains, which are the omega-6s, all right? And everyone's heard about omega-6s. They run from them. They're scared of them. They think they're the worst things out there. They cause inflammation. We have to get rid of omega-6s. That's not exactly right. But now you know that the polyunsaturated fats, all the fats that are coming from um, the seed oils are usually over on that side. In addition, what's really fascinating is these polyunsaturated fatty acids, the PUFAs, can bind to the broken down dead bacteria in your gut. Now, in the horse's gut and your gut, the bacteria are dying constantly. I mean, it just never stops. Um, and then new bacteria are being uh, developed and, and it's a constant flow of new and old. And the old bacteria are actually excreted in the manure. That's what basically manure is. If you're eating right, it's basically dead bacteria that are being re released. All the nutrients have been absorbed and used properly and new bacteria are being formed. So these dead bacteria break down into something called lipopolysaccharides, LPSs. Lipo meaning fat, polysaccharides means sugars. So the sugars and fats bound together is lipopolysaccharides. Just remember LPS. LPS, uh, should I? Why not? Uh, Dr. Uh, Gundry did this in his book. I give him credit for helping me remember. LPSs stand for little pieces of shit. There, I said it. Sorry if you're under 14. We're in a horse world. Uh, everyone says that. So LPSs. And what happens to these LPSs, they bind to this uh, PUFA oil, molecule PUFA. And they're granted a free ride across the gut membrane, which is fascinating. It just flows through the gut. Nobody checks it. It's a form of leaky gut. It goes right through the fat endothelium and right into the system. And it's carried through the bloodstream. And guess where they found those LPS slash PUFA molecules in humans? They found them in your joint fluid. And that's where this inflammation, this chronic inflammation comes from. These uh, PUFAs and LPS is binding and floating in there. And I found that fascinating for a couple of reasons. One, most people who uh, go off their sugar diets and remove all seed oils from their diets, um, one of the biggest things they say is, I don't have stiff joints anymore. I seem to be able to walk better. One of my clients, who is, um, I'm going to say 60, give or take. Um, I saw her just this week, this past week, and I said, you've lost a lot of, of weight. And there's no one who would ever have called her fat. She's as tall as I am, six feet tall anyway, and has always been lean. But when I looked at her, I said, oh my gosh, what happened to all your body fat? It's gone. And she said, I decided to go on a non-inflammatory diet. I said, what does that mean? She says, well, I basically eat uh, walnuts, avocados, and blueberries. <laughs> I said, that's fascinating. So you don't have any seed oils? And she says, no. And I've reduced all the sugar, the grains. And that's because all the dead and dying bacteria from eating inflammatory foods binding with these seed oils were being carried to her body. And she says, I had to do it. I was just aching constantly all the time. I couldn't get rid of my pain. And here she is standing in front of me saying her body aches have gone. And what's interesting is um, this gal here uh, basically said, in the end of her uh, comment of the Facebook, I've got to lean more toward the microphone when I talk. 
She says, I switched them over to grain-free when I got them. Soybean meal, alfalfa, Timothy pellets, a flake of alfalfa and coastal hay every now and then just because. Free choice salt and water and uh, 10 acres of pasture. She goes on to say, as of yesterday, which is only one month since she got it, he is sweating. So the anhydrosis is gone. Seems to have better movement actually trotted in the pasture. Well, that's because you aren't having these, um, these polyunsaturated oils that are being used as lubricants in the food that she's given, plus the inflammatory foods that the horse is given to mix to create all this joint pain. And I hear this over and over. I've got a 30, 32 year old horse that just is moping around. I got him off grain. I put him on soybean meal. He hasn't gained any muscle. He hasn't gained any weight. He's still walking skeleton, but he's 32 years old and he's running around the pasture like he's a young man. He's just completely free of pain. He, he has his life back. And unfortunately they end up dropping dead uh, because it's too late. We started too late. The demise of the horse has already occurred, but the weeks and months before the horse died, he now was living a normal, healthy, pain-free life because he got away from the inflammatory ingredients. And, and most of these are the uh, PUFAs that are in the horse feeds mixed with the inflammatory ingredients that are causing increased LPSs. And they are going through and causing this arthritis. And most of the autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, are caused by these inflammatory reactions that are going on, as well as other autoimmune diseases like Crohn's, lupus, uh, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, and I dare say equine odontoclastic tooth resorption hypersemantosis, also known as EOTRH, or the demise of the front teeth of horses, which wasn't in the textbooks in the 1980s. And now is I see dozens of cases every month. Um, and it's so evident everywhere um, that these are caused by lectins and autoimmune disease and getting rid of the uh, inflammatory ingredients and um, helping these horses stop getting the inflammation in the bone underneath incisors seems to be helping them, but I'm digressing. All right. Um, the uveitis is under control for a minute, <laughs> at least for now, and he looks beautiful. So we have the protein helping the horse's uh, hair coat. We have some muscle coming back because you can see that in the pictures. You have an attitude of a horse that seems to be happier, is running around the field, so he seems to be more pain-free. And the inflammation in his eyes, which is a um, immune system uh, problem going awry in the eye, uh, it's starting to become more controlled. Uh, all of these are reflected back on a horse that knows no longer being inflamed in the gut. So it all boils down to the PUFAs that we feed these horses, and we should avoid vegetable oils, corn oil, canola oil, soybean oil, uh, the soy coca oil um, is, in my mind, very inflammatory. Uh, the coconut oil is a fruit oil. And that brings me to my next subject. Fruit oils, olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, because avocados are fruits. Um, these create MUFAs, MUFAs, monounsaturated uh, fatty acids. And the MUFAs are strain carbons with hydrogens in every position but one. There's one missing. And what, what that does is it makes it liquid at room temperature, which is really nice. But it also tends to cascade more to the omega-3s, which we all know are non-inflammatory. And we're all trying to feed omega-3s to our horses uh, like they were humans were feeding fish, right? Some fish oil, because it's high in omega-3s. So let me explain what omega-3 and omega-6 is, because some of you actually might want to know this. So when you say it, it rolls off your tongue, you actually know what you're talking about. The Greek alphabet uh, is an alphabet that starts with the letter alpha and ends with the letter omega. And that's why they say the alpha omega is the A to Z, if you will, of the Greek alphabet. And the chemists decided that they would label these carbons. The first carbon they were called alpha and they have the beta and the gamma, and they go, and then they said the last one is going to be the omega. So the very last carbon in the string of carbons is always the omega carbon. Now, these carbons 
as they stretch out, need to create double bonds to make them stronger. A single bond is if you and I were holding each other's hands and we're dancing wildly at the uh, hoedown and we're swinging around with one arm up above our head and we're just moving our hips and we're holding on and we get a little rambunctious and our handhold breaks and now we're not connected. That's a single bond. But because we wanna keep dancing, we come back together and we hold each other with two hands. And now we've got a double bond between that person and me as we dance, it's gonna be stronger. And these double bonds make the string of carbon stronger. Now, when you have a double bond, they are attached between certain carbons and they're not between every carbon. I don't know why, this is just nature, this is organic chemistry, but where the first double bond occurs, they count back from the omega to the third carbon and it's called an omega-3 fatty acid. And if it's the first double bond is at the six carbon, it's called an omega-6 fatty acid. So now you know where the omega-3s and the omega-6s come from. They're basically the same thing, but the carbon double bond, it starts at a different position. And because of that, it has a different effect in our body and in the horse's body. In addition, you might have heard of EPA and DHA as being two omega-3 fatty acids that are essential to making us healthy and happy. And we should eat a lot of uh, salmon or uh, fish oil to uh, get these omega-3s, the e EPA and DHA. Well, EPA stands for, E stands for the number of carbons that are in there. It's Latin, I can't pronounce it. I think it's Ioka, I Ike, or whatever. It starts with the letter E I C I coic, like something like that. And that just means that it has uh, 18 carbons. Gosh, I hope I'm right. It could be 20. Anyway, doesn't matter. It's just the number of carbons in there. P, P stands for penta, which means there's five double bonds. So in the whole string of carbons, they are going to have a total of five. That's what penta means. A pentagram, the pentagon, five-sided uh, P means penta five. So the EPA is 18 carbons, five and then A is the, the acid, fatty acid. So that's EPA. DHA, they've added two carbons. So it's gone from 18 to 20, and, tw and D stands for dodeca, which is Latin for 20, I think, or 22. I always get that mixed up. I can't keep it in the brain. I don't know why, but it doesn't matter. You know that EPA's, uh, DHA is two carbons longer than EPA. And DHA, H stands for hexa, so it means it has six carbon uh, double bonds and then A for the acid. So it's either five or six double bonds and they're omega-3s. So that's what everybody wants. I want to have this fish oil. But where does a horse get fish oil? Obviously it's not eating fish. So where's it getting these omega-3s and how does it do them? Well, we're all trying to add these uh, oils to the horses, but the horse lived 100,000 years, 55 million years, depends on what, how you want to look at it without having any oils added to their foods. So my answer to the lady who said, what's the best oil to feed a horse? My answer is none. And the reason is because the gut bacteria of the, of the colon, the hind gut, that big belly that's sitting between their hind legs and straddles between the hind and the front, that, that huge abdomen, that's loaded with bacteria that takes cellulose, which is a structural carbohydrate, and it breaks it down into butyrate, acetate, pyruvate, the three short chain fatty acids. And somehow the horse can take these three uh, short chain fatty acids and they can add carbons to them. And as far as I'm concerned, they add them according to the horse's needs. So they become medium and long chain triglycerides, medium and long chain, chain fatty acids. These fatty acids can either be uh, omega threes or omega sixes, depending on what they need because we all need omega-6s. And in fact, when you eat beef, if you're a meat eater and you eat the fat, and I would encourage you to eat as much of the fat, don't cut it off and leave it aside of the plate. It actually tastes pretty good. But you're taking in about a little less than 50% saturated fat and a little less than 50% MUFAs or monounsaturated fats. And you're taking in about four to 6% polyunsaturated fats in the uh, fat of the animal. And we need those because those um, 
polyunsaturated fatty acids that make up the inflammatory fat uh, fats that we need are there for a purpose and a reason. So we don't want to just label it as a bad guy. You know, uh, there, there are plenty of bad guys in our world that really aren't bad guys. They're doing a job that nobody else wants to do. Uh, and they're necessary. Um, Cleaning the septic tank, not the best thing in the world to do, not something you can attract a mate with, but um, it pays the bills and somebody has to do it and it's a stinky job, but it gets done. And that's what these omega-6s do. So don't be afraid of them. Feed your horse as much cellulose as possible, including that winter pasture that looks like it has no nutrition. It's filled with cellulose. So the bacteria are gonna convert that over into short chain fatty acids and use that as a fuel and use it for the other fats to make the cell membranes and to make um, some of the hormones and to make everything else that fat's needed for. And remember, fat is your preferred fuel at the muscle, not sugar. Sugar is there only for emergencies when the tiger is chasing you and you have to run your heart out until you drop. That's using sugar. Otherwise, to walk down the end of your driveway to get the mail, you're using fat, not sugar. So don't have your bowl of you know cereal to get the energy to go down to the, the mailbox. You know, eat some sort of fat, have some coffee with butter in it and, and, and uh, eat carbon length um, oil, mix it in there with a blender so it doesn't settle on the top and drink it. And that'll give you all the energy you need till sometime in the afternoon when you say, hmm, I'm starting to get hungry. That's because you're using fat. You're asking your body to use the fat for fuel, which is a more efficient fuel. So I think I've answered this one question about um, Henry and why the inflammation seems to be gone, even if it's for a minute, why the horse is sweating again, it's lost all the inflammatory ingredients. And we see this worldwide. Worldwide horses that are taken off grain start sweating in about three to four, maybe five days, uh, whether it's just some dampness that the horse has never had, or they start copiously sweating. Again, it's just fascinating to watch. I hear people from all around the equator, from Australia to Africa to uh, America, say what a difference it's making taking them off grain. Also, the joint uh, are, are more flexible because you don't have the LPSs tied to the MUFAs, pardon me, to the PUFAs. PUFAs and LPSs causing joint inflammation. I'm extrapolating that from humans, but we're seeing it on horses as well. And uveitis, that would be really cool. I think a lot of the inflammatory diseases, such as uveitis, remember anything lends in the word itis is inflammation, arthritis, uveitis, um, that's all encephalitis. They're all inflammatory diseases. And the more you can decrease inflammation in the horse's body, the better chance your ha horse has in attacking the inflammation that's occurring from a pathological process. This again is all about helping a horse thrive in the human world. This is all about filling in the missing um, pieces of the horse, horses, horse owner's manual. Uh, and this is where I really encourage you to get these podcasts out to your friends. You know, text people, say, hey, you got to listen to this. Uh, find out, um, go to your, your podcast, preferred podcast uh, person, such as Apple iTunes, Apple Podcast, and leave a review so more and more people can find this. And um, join the Horses Advocate and become part of the solution. Uh, don't sit on the sidelines. Uh, sitting on the sidelines is fine. I have no problem with that. I think everybody who comes to me or writes me a letter or says, hey, I tried this. It's really worked. I'm so grateful. Uh, is, is fuel enough for me to keep doing this? Uh, but if you become a Horse Advocate member, member you're going to have access to me. You're going to have access to uh, questions and answers monthly directly with me live. Um, Zoom meetings that will take a topic like how to back up a horse trailer uh, using Jesse Mirrors. I can't wait to talk about that one. That's next. Um, and some other things, some really cool stuff. Uh, dig into these topics deeper. Anyway, uh, I've taken enough of your time. Get, get on back to doing what you're doing. I appreciate you so much. I love you all. And uh, this is Doc T. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Hey everyone, Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, 
what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also gonna help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.